Good evening and very welcome to Generation Impact School of Prayer. I'm Amanda Leroux. I'm blessed to be back with you speaking about rebuilding the altar of God. Tonight we are in the purpose of altars. You know, family, it's very important that we understand um, and have a biblical perspective on altars for us to discern the false and the demonic and the counterfeit. So just before I, I um, start, I want to share a short testimony. You know, I've been praying for my dad's salvation for many, many years, coming from a, a background where my forefathers belonged to a religion where they had to bring sacrifices, they had to burn candles, they had to burn uh, uh, wax dolls, and um, sometimes they had to crawl on their knees with steps up to the idol that the bloodline has worshipped. Okay, so I've been praying about this for ages and, um, and asking the Holy Spirit to reveal to me anything, anything that opposes the kingdom of God in me, the kingdom of God in my family, everything that opposes God's blessings to the next generation and the next. Because my heart is that we will tap into everything that God has provided through the full cross work of Jesus Christ. I want to be one of those who exchange um, what belonged to darkness for that what belonged to the kingdom of light because we are bearers of light, the light of Christ and we are sent by our Lord Jesus to demolish, to break down everything that belongs to the kingdom of darkness and bring the light right there, right into that area. So for us, to be able to do that, we also need to understand what was traditions that's not from God. Mark 7. You can go and read Mark, Mark 7, where the word says, don't believe what your forefathers is telling you, but believe what Christ is telling you. So, um, yes, I had a dream just before I led my dad to the Lord, and he came to me in the dream, and he said to me, Amanda, the bloodline has lost its power over you. And I thought, wow, that's amazing. But then he said, but you need to come with me to do a ritual because the bloodline cannot lose its power over you. And we have been going backwards and forwards in this dream and I explained to him, no, Dad, this is the best news I could ever get. And, and he said, no, but you need to come with me and do this ritual. And the end of the story is, is how I said to him that, unfortunately, this is what I was fighting for in prayer, in warfare, in seeking God, is that the bloodline, would lose its power over me. And I will not do one ritual to bring that back. And I woke up. And you know, God explained to me the importance of us understanding that there need to come a time in our lives where we ask Him, God, what altars were raised against you to establish paganism in my DNA? And we think many times it will be just an altar that we find there in a cave that like we have found, altars in caves, we, you know, and, um, and in, in low places and high places. But you know what? Many times it was traditions. Traditions that we kept alive, that raised an altar, unto Satan to bind and to cut us from our God-given blessings on earth that would 
Satan's entire plan of altars and the altar in the Old Testament we spoke about it last week it is a place of sacrifice it's where uh, um, you know animals would be sacrificed unto God but on the earth today there's still altars where where wax dolls are sacrificed, where there is animal sacrifices taking place, where there is human sacrifices taking place, and all of that, the purpose is to bring worship to the wrong God, to the wrong kingdom, to establish strongholds, and to disconnect family lines from the goodness and the blessings of the Lord. And we will see it. So I want us not to only think about you know, the people out there, they are doing. I want us to make this personal and say, but God, for me to deal with the land and the issues of the land, I need to understand where in my bloodline um, did we oppose the kingdom and maybe we did not fully apply the fulfilled cross work of Christ and we did not fully enter the rest, the rest of God. The rest with is no sweat and there's no rituals because Jesus fulfilled all that. We need to ask, if I can tell you about one more of these things, um, you know, um, the one of the, the next uh, um, points is uh, all three supplies of dedication. Now, we think about, you know, godly things concerning dedication, but one of the things that manifested in my family, and I need to tell you about it tonight because the Holy Spirit prompts me to do that, is we are hunters. My family line, they are hunters. So we taught our children about the hunting rituals, about making covenants with animal spirits. So we know about the rituals that they do when they go and hunt the first animal and um, that is the blood and the liver or the kidneys or something even more weird, men, you will understand. So my sons went for their first, um, uh, um, they on their first hunting trip and I taught them the truth, no blood, no eating of liver, we divorced ourselves, we severed ourselves um, from all those, those um, rituals that our forefathers used to do to get themselves protection against elephants and whales and whatever, okay. So now mom we understand. So that came back, a long story short, I discovered that one of the men bullied my sons into not their dad, one of the men bullied them into this blood on the face thing and eating of liver or whatever they had to eat. And I called them because we are a family that understand we have a destiny in God and we do not need interference. No altars established because we have the grandest altar of all Jesus Christ on the cross. Okay. So I called them and I prayed, I took my first son, my youngest son, who was actually the one who wrote an, uh, um, a little story about his dedication to, to with the blood and the, um, the liver, I think that. And when I started to pray over him, that animal spirit manifested and choked him. Choked him, he couldn't get um, brief. Um, yeah, he couldn't breathe. He, and, and, you know, I had to do deliverance on him. And since then, my sons, my, they are now grown-ups with their own children, they advocate not to do this. They would call me, Mom, please tell then their friends, um, fathers or mothers, whoever. But, you know, because I had this first-hand experience of a demonic way of de dedication, they would not do that to anybody else. They felt the effect of that spirit on them. So I, why do I share this tonight? The Holy Spirit is prompting me to tell you, don't think it's only those who serve the evil one, the devil. 
in all the different dimensions of the kingdom of darkness that are sacrificing. We should check every little ritual that we are doing. Even when we go out, even when we go fishing. And make sure that what we do belongs to the kingdom of light. Amen? This is how Satan deceives us in establishing a covenant that's not from God. So this is the other reason why um, we, we have altars. It's a place of covenant making. So Abraham raised the altar after God made a covenant with him. And, um, and you know, for us, it became the altar of Jesus. And the moment that we receive him as a savior and a master, and we make him Lord, we become, we, he, we become part of the covenant that he has solely cut on our behalf. Because he knew we will never be able to cut a covenant and keep to that. He did that on our behalf. So family, be aware of the fact that some of the rituals and rites and stuff in family lines can connect you to the wrong altar. And I can honestly say to you, I have a book thick like this, full of testimonies of how God has revealed to me and to where we ministered the demonic covenants made out of ignorance. Anything that concerns blood, you can, you can, without even knowing it, get yourself in trouble by making a covenant with the wrong spirit. Um, I mean, the fourth point is um, an altar is a place of encounter and communion. So we, we should encounter God, encounter him at the cross of Calvary. You can go and have a look at the different places in the Old Testament where God's people encountered him and then they built an altar like Jacob when God saved him from his brother. But in Exodus 25, 22, the Lord gave us his heart. He says, there I will meet with you and from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim that are upon the ark of the testimony, I will speak intimately with you of all which I will give you in commandment to the Israelites. Now speaking to Moses there, but do you know that this altar is still alive? It's in heaven. It is still speaking. God is still speaking from this altar in heaven. Nothing changed. In those days before Jesus, we know God spoke through a specific person to his people. But now we have the Holy Spirit. And Jesus is still serving at that altar, the altar of Melchizedek in heaven, the, the, the tabernacle in heaven, the mercy seat in heaven. It still exists in heaven. And we have direct connection. We have direct communication. And whatever hinders, stops, interferes with the direct communication in heaven. If any person tell you, you have to go through a priest to receive your healing. It's not God. You must go through a priest to hear if you are allowed to start a business. It's not God. Because Jesus came, he rented the 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 um uh, um the veil, and also speaking of our soul that pro that prohibits us from entering in a spirit dimension. He dealt with the soul. He dealt with the powers that lies in our souls, and our hearts that should become the altar unto God, from where He should reign. His throne should be over our hearts. His Lordship should be over our hearts. So for us, we need to understand anything that, that separates you from directly entering in the name of Jesus 
to the Holy of Holies where you have communion with the Father himself. That's not from God. You do not need permission from any person to pray, to communicate with God, to build a relationship. In fact, it's your birth right now because you are a son of God, a daughter of God, a child of God. So we also know that the altar was a place of forgiveness and sacrifice was offered on this brazen altar. Um, uh, yes, as I said, and you know, Jesus came and he fulfilled that purpose fully. So point six is as a place of worship. So people would come with a, to the altar of incense and, and, um, in the Old Testament, the high priest had to go into the Holy of Holies once a year with this, with the incense to uh, make a way through the the, the um, veil. The incense, the smoke of the incense made a way. But for us, our lifestyle of worship unto God should be a beautiful fragrance of Christ to his nostrils. Our every part of our moving should be as um, a worship unto God. Worship is not only one short song, three four songs. Worship is a lifestyle. It's where my heart is totally dedicated to the Lord, to the purposes of the Lord. And, um, and it should be a perpetual thing. When we look at Exodus 30 verse 7 to 8, the last part of verse 8 says, A perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generations. This is what um, the instruction was to Aaron. Is that a perpetual incense should come before God. Now for us... In the New Testament, as intercessors, as prayer warriors, as children of God, we are all called to be a house of prayer for all nations unto God. There's not one person that can say, no, this is not applicable to me. Your life should become this fragrance of Christ unto Father God. So now in the Old Testament, they had to bring you know, um, this uh, to burn the incense. But we are become burning ones unto God. Our lives become a burning, fiery life unto God. And as we live in the truth of um, who we became as a new creation, we became, our hearts became, an altar unto God that's 24 7 releasing the fragrance of Jesus because we give way to the new man because we release what belonged to our busy days and to the days when we were still submitting under laws rules and regulations and being set free by Christ now we burn for Jesus Love becomes the law that rule over us. And the more we give ourselves in abounding love, in a, a lifestyle of following the example of Jesus, we become a 24-7, a perpetual incense before the Lord. And we transfer that to our children's children. So everything that hinders the incense of worship, the incense of prayer, the incense of a dedicated life unto God belongs to a different altar. And we should lay that down. We should take up our cross, follow Jesus. The cross, the most grandest altar of all. And um, so we need to understand, family, it's a practical thing. Now, um, the altar is also a place of intercession. We know that. And Joel 2 verse 17 is still applicable to us today. And the Lord says, Let the priests, let the ministers of the Lord weep between the porch and the altar. 
and we became the royal priests of the Lord. We spoke about it in a previous session. So we stand between the porch and the altar. The altar is now in heaven. So we stand between the, the porch is the land, the people of the land, and the altar is before God, the altar that is living in, uh, in heaven. So the order of Melchizedek is our high priest belongs to this order and he serves at his altar, the eternal altar of Melchizedek in heaven. So we stand before God on behalf of the land. And as we do this intercession, we raise an altar in the spirit dimension for God, before God, to impact the land. Do you understand? Then I said, as a contact point with deities. So you can go and read all the scriptures, but um, godly encounters causes heaven to open leading to divine revelation and connection between heaven and earth. So, um, you know, our encounter with God, when we encounter Him, when we take time out, we create an open heaven for revelation knowledge to flow. So, and it normally involves also angelic activities and the angelic encounters. So as I built my altar right here where I said, this is my prayer room from where I speak to you. Do you know that this altar impacts your neighbors? It impacts your city? Because from this place an open heaven is, is created. And and angelic entities, angels of different dimensions, different ranks, different, different orders are released. And people start to phone and ask you, but do you pray for do you pray for people? This is what's happening with me all the time, although I do not advertise I'm praying for people. But God, because there's an open heaven, God can direct people, those who want to connect with you in prayer or whatever, to bring salvation to their souls or whatever. And then they will start to ask you. It happens to me all the time. And you impact through your prayer altar, your city, more powerfully than what you think. And um, so we need to know that the, the altar that we built is a prayer altar. It's a dedicated life to God. And it releases the supernatural. Um, yes. So there is two types. You can go through your, your, your notes. Um, I just need to go with the flow of Holy Spirit tonight. So two types of altars. is the altar unto God. And then there's the altar to Satan. Okay. And, um, and we need to understand that we are, as we build altars unto God, the, the presence of God in our cities, you know, the altar enthrones the more prayer I bring to God. It enthrones God, not only, uh, only over my heart, not only over my, my home, but over my city or my region, you know. Because when God is enthroned, when He is lifted up, He draws people to Him and the demonic cannot stand. The demonic cannot stand. I've seen it with my own eyes. How, how these evil doers, rulers, evil people crawl away because they can physically not stand. Amen. And then, also, um, yeah, I have spoken to you about the the different places, different different people who raised up altars unto God. So um, we said that an altar can be a physical monument, you know, raised by people like Abraham and Isaac, Jacob and Moses, David, Gideon, Samuel. But there's also many examples. I only mentioned three. Many examples of demonic altars in the Bible and Gideon's father, because Gideon had to 
break down his father's altars. And we have to do the same. You know, there is nothing so destructive like tradition. Traditions that opposes the kingdom of light, that opposes God. We need to break that down. King Jeroboam, and then obvious um, at 17 is one of my favorite examples, Paul in Athens, when he, when he grieved over the city, when he saw all the idols and the altars that's been raised to idols. So we should also grieve for that, okay? And then also, um, a temple can, uh, an altar can be an, a temple, um, like the temple in Jer Jerusalem, an institution, as we found in 2 Chronicles 6.21, with the temple of um, Solomon, King Solomon. And the word says, and I want to read it to you, so that you can have an understanding that sometimes church buildings can be an altar, but not unto God. Listen to this. This was unto God. So listen to and heed the requests of your servant and your people Israel, which they shall make facing this place. Hear from your dwelling place, heaven, and when you hear, forgive. God will hear and forgive because of the covenant that David made and um, the temple that was then erected to King Solomon. So they had to face the physical building as they worship God. Now, um, we see this is still going on. Today we do not go and worship at buildings. The Lord said he will break it down in three days and rebuild his temple. And we became the temple of God. We are full to his presence today. So if we worship a building, if we think the presence of God is only in a building, it's deception, then we need to deal with this wrong mindset. Amen? Um, maybe why God is changing everything in the days we live in. And then a person can also be an altar and we know that Jesus and the cross of Calvary are the ultimate example of, of altar. And that's why we turned to him. So again in Hebrews 9, 12, the word says, He went once and for all into the holy of holies of heaven, not by virtue of the blood of goats and calves, by which to make reconciliation between God and man, but his own blood, having found and secured a complete redemption and everlasting release for us. So that altar is still functioning today. The altar is served by our eternal high priest Jesus. The voice of his blood speaks a better thing for eternity that makes his eternal altar a system of authorization that allows every person that call upon his name to be saved, delivered and a new creation. Amen. So um, today you can go through your notes, but today we are that te the temple of the Holy Spirit. And you can go and study the last part of the notes family. Um, we, you know, we need to understand that uh, um, in verse 13, verse 15, uh, verse f uh, Hebrews 13, verse 15, the word says, Through him, therefore, let us constantly and at all times offer up to God a sacrifice of praise, which is the fruit of lips that thankfully acknowledge and confess and glorify his name. And Father, I thank you indeed, Lord God. Our bodies became a temple and our hearts an altar unto you, Lord God. And Lord, we can tap into the ultimate altar of all 
all times, Jesus Christ, His grace, His love, His provision and everything we need. I pray, bless your sons and daughters. Father, as they seek your face this week to see whether there is still the fruit of demonic altars speaking, hindering, dividing, give them courage to take up their own cross and follow Jesus as a new creation. In Jesus' name, I bless you and I love you. Till next week.